medisi. In the scripture, God says to us, do not be afraid. For I am your God. Do not be dismayed. For I am with you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will hold you up with my strong hand. And our Lord Jesus says to us, come to me. All you who are weary, heavily laden, I will give you rest. Thank you for gathering this morning as we remember, honor, and celebrate the life of Harvey Moon. And as we hold on to and celebrate the promises that are ours in the good news of Jesus our Savior. Would you please join me in the opening prayer printed in your worship folder? Eternal God, we praise you for all your people who have kept the faith, finished the race, and now bless us in you. We thank you for those who are here for us, especially our party, whom you have received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years.
I'd like to invite Trudy and Jody Severs. Pastor Andrew. Family, friends, good morning. Jody and I worked for Harvey in the office of the governor. And we know that family members were Harvey's treasures. So it came as a very great honor when Harvey and Ann asked me and Jody to stay with their children, Christine, Michael, and Daniel, in the governor's office mansion while they traveled to Germany in November of 1978. We must have been very lenient because the three of them still talk about how much fun they had. <laughs> they were playing pool with Jody in the basement. They had me attending a program at Daniel's Elementary School. And they were eating lots of snacks and staying up way past their official bedtime. And so as thanks for our help, or as I really think it was payback, Upon learning, the children now had new expectations about what constituted proper parenting. Harvey instructed us to travel to Saskatchewan, Canada with members of the Farmers Union. <laughs> Jody and I were to attend meetings and visit firsthand with individuals involved with the Saskatchewan program that encouraged and gave financial help to young farmers. That was because Harvey was contemplating proposing a Young Farmer Homestead Act for South Dakotans. Travel on a bus to Saskatchewan <laughs> in the middle of December. <laughs> Sounds great. But that trip to Canada was when we learned that traveling with the Farmers Union members is just one continuous caramel roll eating coffee drinking, ham sandwich eating, sing along. Harvey really would have loved being on the trip, so we won. So upon our return to Pierre, we reported back to Harvey all the things we had learned. And although Harvey's proposed bill did not get enacted, South Dakota does now have a beginning farmer bond program to help beginning farmers acquire agricultural property at lower interest rates. Sometimes it takes certain seeds longer to germinate than others. But Harvey's inspiration for this proposal, as well as for many others benefiting our citizens and our economy, can, I think, be attributed to two things. One, the seat of his tractor. <laughs> and two, satellite radio was not available in 1970s in Spink County. Therefore, Harvey had plenty of time to formulate, consider, and reconsider his plans and proposals uninterrupted by talk radio. But his thinking out of the box came from sitting in the cab of that tractor. And he did spend a lot of time on a tractor, but he also spent a lot of time over the years in his public service in the legislature, as lieutenant governor, and as governor. In each of those roles, he worked across party lines, believing in the power of bipartisanship. And when he was governor, he invited groups of people, including cabinet secretaries and legislators, to dinners at the mansion. Now, I do not know how much bipartisan support for proposed legislation for that upcoming 1979 legislature resulted from this form of his reaching across the aisle. I do know that the dinner guests reached across the table for more and more of that delicious food prepared by First Lady Ann Wallman. <laughs> that sacrifice of time that Harvey made in the name of public service was also a sacrifice of time borne by Ann, Christine, Michael, and Daniel. He had great pride and love for you three children also high standards, which you have met 
and exceeded. And you grandchildren, he, he was so proud of each of you. He loved you all just dearly and unabashedly. And his face just beamed when he spoke of you to us. And of course you, Anne, his rock of stability, the love of his life, his Annie. I contacted my friend Barbara Johnson to let her and her husband, our former United States Senator Tim Johnson, know that Harvey had passed away. She responded immediately regarding Harvey and Ann. And she said, were there ever two better people, kind, gentle, funny, and smart? Before I begin, I'd like uh, to help demonstrate something for the family here, if you would assist me. So if you're here from out of state, please just raise your hand so we can see. Yeah, a little higher. Wow, very good. And then uh, if you, oh, I'm sorry. And, and if you are from South Dakota, please, if you live here now, please raise your hand. Thank you, thank you. Now, I'm not going to try to give you a comprehensive overview of all the good things Harvey did in his public life. You can find that in his obituary in the little program you got this morning and many places online. But as you look that over, you might think, oh, that's nice, but it was 50 years ago. Hold that. I have picked out just three examples from all of the works that have had his fingerprints on them. And this morning I hope to give you an idea of the scope and magnitude and scale of those good works as measured by the number of people whose lives he touched. So. When you reach a certain age, you find yourself spending some time in the waiting area of an exam room in your doctor's office. Now, for years, I've made it a point to read the medical diplomas hanging on the wall. Uh, try it next time you're in one of those rooms. Uh, if you live in South Dakota here, you may well notice that a surprising number of our doctors were graduated from the medical school at the University of South Dakota. In fact, if you do that over time, you may well begin to wonder what might have happened without him, because Harvey was the prime sponsor of the bill that created the four-year medical school at the University of South Dakota. Prime sponsor means he was the guy who had a heavy hand in authoring the bill and then quarterbacking it through the legislature. Having known Harvey and worked with Harvey through the years, whenever I was in one of those rooms looking at one of those medical diplomas from USD, I had this automatic little click and I thought, Harvey did that. So now I want to ask you to call upon your imagination to get some idea of the magnitude of this. So if you want to close your eyes, that's fine, but not necessarily. I want to have you make a picture in your mind that you're sitting in one of those doctor's office exam rooms waiting for the doc to show up somewhere here in South Dakota. Well, the walls in my uh, clinic are green. But now pretend that you are the first patient up on Monday morning. You're sitting there. Right now, you've got that exam room all to yourself, but as soon as you are done, somebody else will be sitting there. And then somebody else. And then somebody else. If the doc you're seeing today happens to be a general practitioner, family doctor, by the time just that one Monday is over for that one doc, 
he or she would have seen dozens of, uh, upwards of two dozen South Dakota doctors. Now think, that happens at least five days a week, week in, week out, year after year. So let's try to gauge how many South Dakotans have received care from doctors who have graduated from our School of Medicine here. So, if you've ever been treated by a doctor, excuse me, who got his or her medical degree at the University of South Dakota, or if you know someone who has, raise your hand, please. Wow, look at that. Just look at how many lives have been touched, but we have to multiply that by all of the doctors in all of the towns, in the counties and cities all over South Dakota, week after week, year after year. It's a staggering number, a staggering amount of health care. And that is just one measurement of how many lives Harvey touched. Of course, you know Harvey, and you know what he'd say. Oh, it wasn't me so much. <laughs> I was just lucky to have so many smart people to work with. The next item is a little bit more behind the scenes stuff. South Dakota was the sole sponsor of the, or Harvey rather, was the sole sponsor of the bill to create the South Dakota Investment Council. And when I tell people that, they go, uh, what's that? Well, let's rewind back to the early 1970s. South Dakota state government did not have a unified pension plan back then. It had lots of plans. There was one for educators, one for law enforcement, one for state employees, and so forth. Many of those plans were rel relatively small. Often they did not have professional investment guidance. So the benefits were widely varied from one group to the next and collectively they were among the worst in the nation. Now think of Harvey sitting in his tractor thinking about that. Harvey's bill consolidated those scattered pension plans into a single unified retirement plan whose combined funds achieved critical mass so that they could hire top-notch professional money managers. It has ranked in the top 1% of such plans in the nation just about every year since its inception. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, Harvey's leadership resulted in billions of dollars in more retirement benefits for South Dakota retirees. Well, okay, so what does that mean? I have a couple of friends who have served on the Investment Council, so I asked one of them that question. He told me that the pension of a retired state employee is probably about double what it would have been, thanks to Harvey, about double. So let's measure that one. If you happen to be a teacher here, South Dakota, or in law enforcement, or a state employee, or if someone you know, someone close to you is in one of those categories, please raise your hand. Wow, just look in the air, keep the hands in the air, look around, especially grandchildren, don't be afraid, look around, see how many hands are up. Look at how many lives were touched. Now, multiply that by the number of state employees and retirees in all the other towns, cities and counties all over South Dakota. And then you have the ripple effect. Multiply that by all of the grocery stores and bait shops and boat motor repair shops where those folks are spending their retirement money. <laughs> of course, you know Harvey you know what he'd say. He'd say, oh, it wasn't really me so much. I, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. 
I just got lucky. Okay, here's the last one. My business and personal life in Rapid City sometimes brings an encounter with someone who's just starting out in life, getting married, beginning a home, wanting to buy a house. And once again, when I hear that, that automatic little I knew Harvey thing clicks. So I ask him, how are you going to finance that house? And time after time, they all say, oh, South Dakota housing. And they kind of look at me like, well, duh, why would you even ask? South Dakota housing, of course. No, not of course. Not without Harvey's help. He sponsored the bill that created the South Dakota Housing Development Authority and helped quarterback it through the legislature and down to Governor Knipe for signature. So here's how that one works. The authority from time to time goes to Wall Street and rounds up a big pile of money at lower interest rates than you or I could ever get. It then uses that money, that savings on the interest, to make home mortgage interest rates more affordable and the down payments more affordable for low and moderate income people who otherwise would be out of reach for that. Last year alone, I think they financed about $300 million in more affordable loans. So just last year alone, that's a couple thousand houses. And it's been going on for 49 years. So when you total it up for 49 years, you get something like 93,000 families who are able to get into home ownership. Think about that. 93,000 households, not people, households. That's astounding. So add another 10 or 12,000 apartments, which means, among other things, that a lot of elderly people get to live out their lives in a nice apartment. Add it all up, it's about 100,000 households, not people, got to add the kids and the grandkids. An astounding number in our small state. So that means that probably everyone here knows someone whose life was touched by that thing Harvey did. And once again, you know Harvey, you know what he'd say. He'd say, oh, it wasn't me so much. But of course it was. He was so good at communicating with people and so good at putting them at ease that he was one of the best catalysts of change that South Dakota ever had. We will all miss Harvey. When you find yourself feeling lonesome about that, hit the pause button. Remember all the good things he did. Remember all of the people whose lives were touched for the better. There are so many of them. And as you saw with those hands going up, they are so much around us that it will be a long, long time before the mark that Harvey made will fade away. So, here's my conclusion. When you get up on the road that Harvey was walking, you'll never walk alone. Trudy's going to tell you how to find that road. Harvey gave us not only a map, but he gave us the GPS coordinates of how to find that road in his remarks during his induction into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And here is what Harvey said. We live in a great state. Its blessings outweigh its problems. Its future will be determined by the actions of ordinary citizens like you and me.
Before I read our scripture passages for today, permit me to share some Harvey Wallman memories that I have. Harvey and I have been continuous good friends ever since we were elementary schoolboys. Even though we grew up on farms that were 10 miles apart, our parents attended the same rural country church and our families were close friends as well. Harvey and I graduated from the same high school. We both were graduates of Huron College. We both taught high school for a few years at Doland. And when Harvey and Ann were married, I was her best man. <coughs> Harvey will be remembered as someone who made a difference. He made life better for others. Now his public service and political record are well documented. But something that is only documented on our collective memories is his impact on the lives of his friends and neighbors. We knew him as a neighbor, as wise and thoughtful. He was the go-to guy if we had problems. Not just a government problem, although he surely did know how to navigate political bureaucracy, but he was visited by us for business problems, for relational problems, for church problems, you name it. People who knew him respected his opinion. We trusted his judgment, and most of the time, we followed his counsel. And that is how his friends and neighbors are going to remember Harvey Wallman. And now I invite all of us here to embrace the words that are found in the Holy Scriptures. Our first reading is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Our second reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And our final reading is from the Gospel of John, the setting of these verses is the death of Lazarus. In John 11, verses 21 through 27. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Thank you. 
thank you, Don. Those scriptures were chosen for us today by Harvey's family. And I trust that in them we will get a glimpse of who God made his child Harvey to be, as well as the firm reassurance of God's promise through Christ. So the first, the first reading, Psalm 121, this is a traveling song, originally meant to be sung by pilgrims, hiking on their way up, up to Jerusalem to visit God's house. Jerusalem is up in the hills, so, so you're always, you're hiking upward, raising your eyes to the hills, step after step. It reminds me of a time Harvey told me about uh, hiking up Black Elk Peak, the, the, the highest point in South Dakota, with, I think he said it was with Frank Farrar and, and some other friends just a few years ago, uh, how much he enjoyed that. And so that's, as, as Don read that, that's, that's what I imagined, Harvey hiking upward, one foot after another. But as, as the pilgrims would, would walk, they would sing and pray this song. And again, how like Harvey, singing and praying, especially singing. You know, solos, quartets, choirs from the time he was, you know, this tall until just a, just a couple of weeks ago. I'm meeting Anne in the, in, the Huron church, in the Huron College Choir, singing and directing in church choirs. I remember him telling me, you know, he didn't just think about politics on that tractor because he told me how during his tractor time he would, uh, he, he remembered praise choruses from Christian Endeavor and he would sing one for every letter of the alphabet, at least one verse. And if he finished all 26, he would just start over again, he said. And just, just, a, just a couple of weeks ago, he, he sang with the uh, Presbyterian Church Choir, uh, helping me learn the bass line, and you know that the song was, soon and very soon, I'm going to see the king. How true. Now the pilgrims, going up the road to Jerusalem, they never walked alone. They went together as family, as community. And again, how like Harvey. He was dedicated to the people that God put into his life. And his children, his grandchildren, you, his friends and neighbors. And I could see that love for his community in so many ways, whether it was just loving the land. You know, he was showing me a picture a few weeks ago of a, of a sunrise over the James, how, and explaining how, how nature was telling forth the glory of God, he said. You know, the way he intentionally would seek out and welcome people in this congregation, if he sensed that someone was feeling marginalized, he would go alongside them and say, you belong here. I want you here. I saw that happen on multiple occasions. Um, the way he celebrated uh, the, the, the land, the good harvest, uh, the, the centennial farm his family has, has enjoyed, and of course his extensive community and public service. But now even with the com community's protection, the, the journey to Jerusalem could be a dangerous and difficult one. You remember the story Jesus told about the, the Good Samaritan, about the man assaulted on the road, right? That was the same road that the pilgrims were wa are walking here. You know, bad weather, and rough road conditions, exhaustion and enemies, all these things plagued the pilgrims. And how like our lives? Life is just a pilgrimage for all of us. We're just passing through and we do go through our dangers, through our trials. And so with the pilgrims, we sing this song Save us, O oh God, save us from life's perils. And in verse three, we get the answer. Where it says, God will not let your foot sleep. The one who watches over you will not slumber. The one who watches over you never slumbers nor sleeps. Now the promise here, as Harvey knew well, is not an easy life, but rather a defended one. Not, not a cushioned life, but rather the promise that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't go alone. Our Savior goes with us. God, our Maker, Jesus, our Savior, the Holy Spirit, our life, keeps us this day and forever. And oh, we need that promise because we can feel in our bones that human strength, this human life, does give out. It does fail. In the second reading, 
from Isaiah 40. It points out even young people get tired. Even the strong sometimes stumble. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Now hope, hope, that's to trust in the Lord, to lean on God, to put all your weight on God so that when you fall, you simply fall on him, fall into his arms, so that when we grow weak, we are borne up on his wings. I know Harvey loved to fly so much, soaring over the fields and the rivers of South Dakota, and I think of the faith that lifted him as well, how he did hope in the Lord. Now, Harvey had a strong faith, and Christian faith is sometimes caricatured. You know, we, we, we say that people, people with a strong faith are, you know, so heavenly minded they're no earthly good, right? Well, you know, Harvey <laughs> proved that wrong, didn't he? Because he was convinced, on the one hand, of God's goodness, but also convinced that here in this world, God's people are God's normal plan A. That if God wants the hungry fed, we ought to do something about feeding the hungry. That if God wants justice, well, we can work on that. You know, he was a fixer, a doer, confident in his mission, but humble about himself. And that's the perspective Psalm, uh, Isaiah 40 calls us to, realism about our own limitations but supreme confidence in our unlimited God. Now, how, how can we have that confidence? You know, on a day like today, a day when we feel the emptiness and the, and the grief, we, we certainly know our limitations, but it, it's, it's harder to be confident. How do we know that God loves us? How do we know that death is not the end? Jesus shows us. In the last scripture that Don read, Jesus speaks with his friend Martha, who's just lost her brother Lazarus, and he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? In other words, Jesus is taking this promise of, of, of eternal life, our hope of resurrection, of, of, of restoration, of, of remaking of heaven and earth, and of all good things. He's taking all those hopes and he's putting them all on himself. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. But how do we know that that life Jesus has can be ours? How do we know that we qualify? Well, we don't. We don't qualify. You know, just last month, Harvey was, was gathering, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, after worship with a few of us in the East Room, and he said something. He said he'd been reading the book of Daniel, and he read that passage about being found, you know, being, being weighed in the balance and found wanting. Now, that might seem like a strange thing to mention at a funeral, except that it's true about all of us, about every last one of us. We have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is that God has never given up on us. When we cut ourselves off from God, God ate to reconnect with you, with me, with Harvey. And that reminds me a lot of Harvey, actually. He was such a connector. You know, whether, you know, my first Christmas in, in, in South Dakota, what, almost 14 years ago, you know, he, he said, oh, you got to go out on a Saturday when I'm going to be there, because he wanted to give us a tour of, of the Capitol and the Christmas trees. And yes, we saw his portrait. <laughs> it was wonderful. He, the, the temple of democracy, as he called it, right? or whether he was you know, carefully explained to me the functional difference between a propane tractor or a gas tractor, or, 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 or bringing my son a book back from Europe just to spark some interest in history in an eight-year-old. He just wanted to connect with people, all ages, all backgrounds, quietly encouraging people to have patience and understanding with those who are different. You know, like his God, Harvey, wanted to connect. And so God took the ultimate step to reconnect with us, 
God came to us in the flesh, in Jesus Christ. And on the cross, Christ experienced our danger, that we might have his protection. On the cross, he took our weakness, that we might receive his strength. On the cross, he took our sin, that we might be dressed up in his righteousness. Now in his burial, Christ went to earth, that we might rise on those eagles' wings. And in his resurrection, he arose, the first part of God's great resurrection, the first part of God's great remaking of all good things. He arose that we might rise. He arose so that nothing in heaven or on earth, in the future or in the past, in life or in death, that nothing at all may separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I will begin us in prayer and invite you to join me in praying, in praying the Lord's Prayer as printed in the bulletin in a moment. <clears throat> Eternal God, we thank you again for your child, Harvey. We praise you for the gift of Harvey's life, for everything in him that was faithful and kind and good and gracious. And we thank you for the grace you gave him in Jesus Christ, the grace that enabled him to love you and to love his neighbors as himself, to serve you so faithfully. And we thank you that for Harvey, death is past, weakness is ended, pain is no more. We thank you that he has entered into the joy, the rest, and peace that you prepared for him. Please help us, Lord. Give us faith today, faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom. 
And where our vision fails, help us to trust your love that never fails. Lift our sorrow today and give us good hope in Jesus so that we may bravely walk our earthly way and look forward to that glad day of reunion in the life to come. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us how to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
to give Harvey the last word today. <laughs> this is a prayer written by Harvey. O oh Lord, as we voice our individual hopes in an exercise called prayer, we acknowledge that as mortals our understanding of the divine is limited. To help us in these times to lower our voices and raise our commitment to peace and unity as we face unresolved challenges. We want to be a grateful people. We are grateful for the warmth and fellowship and purpose you've given us and for the joy of sharing food in abundance, as is our custom. Help us never to take it for granted and arouse in us a desire and a goal to eradicate poverty in our communities and in the world. We humbly acknowledge your presence and ask your continued blessing for our food, for good friends, and for peace in our time. 